In this video, we're going to take a look at the new NVIDIA iRay renderer available in Substance Designer 5.3. The iRay renderer creates physically accurate renderings by tracing light paths. It requires little setup and is fully integrated into Substance Designer. So here in my 3D view, I'm currently using the OpenGL default renderer, and we can easily switch to iRay by just going to the renderer tab and then choosing the iRay renderer. With iRay, you can create stunning, high-quality renders directly in Substance Designer without having to export to third-party applications. The navigation works the same as it does in the OpenGL viewport, so here you can see that I can position my camera here to set up my shot. And then when I finish, iRay will start to refine the render. Now, the level of interactivity that you get depends on your render settings. And so that's what we're going to do at this point is start to take a look at the settings for utilizing iRay. So the first thing you're going to want to do is go to Tools, Preferences. And then here under 3D View, you want to make sure that for the iRay section here under Hardware, that your graphics card is recognized and that it is enabled and that the CPU is disabled. So this is the setup you're going to want to have when you're working with iRay. Next, let's take a look at the sampling settings. So we're going to go to Render, and then I'm going to hit this Edit button. And then here in the Properties, you can see that we have our settings here for progressive rendering. So here we have the controls uh, that are going to allow you to adjust the quality of the render. So here we have our sampling controls and our min sample and max sample. We have a time control. And then we have here a caustic sampler. So by default, this is disabled. If you want to utilize or render caustics, you would enable this. We also have the Firefly filter, which not only has a very cool name, but also helps to improve the quality of the render by removing any very bright pixels. Now, in terms of adjusting the quality, it's vital to understand how the sampling and the max time is going to work. iRay will continue to refine an image based on the max time, but also it takes into consideration the minimum samples. So, for instance, we have these sliders. Now, you can double click here to enter in a numeric value if you don't want to just use the sliders. So, by default, this min samples is set to 250. And the max time here is actually set to 60. So let's just set this real quick. And so here we have the default settings. The minimum samples is the value that iRay is going to use regardless of what you have here for this max time. So in this example, we have 250 minimum samples and our max time is set to 60. Now let's say that our max time was set to something like five seconds. The min samples will override this max time if it cannot get the minimum value within the time allotted. So again, going back to that, if we had this max time set at 5 seconds and we couldn't get 250 samples within this time of 5 seconds, then iRay is going to take longer to refine the image. So again, with this min samples, you can guarantee that you are always going to get at least this minimum number of samples in your render. So now, if we focus on the actual settings that we have, our min samples at 250 and our max time at 60 seconds, within this time allotted, iRay will be able to get this minimum 250 samples. And once iRay has hit this minimum samples, if there is still time available, it will continue to sample the image up to the setting we have here in our max samples. So as you can see, this is set very high by default. So what we are essentially saying here is iRay sample at least 250 and then continue to sample up to 60 seconds. Now going back to this max samples, let's say that we had this set to something like 500. If iRay hits this max samples before it hits the time allotted here in the max time, then iRay is going to stop the refinement regardless of this max time setting. So when you're in the process of adjusting your texture or setting up your shot, you'll probably want to change your min and max samples. So for instance, I'm going to set this to one sample and for the max, I'm going to set this to one as well. So I'm not going to worry about the time. I'm just going to control the render based on my sampling. And so here in the viewport, I can start to just kind of move, uh, just kind of set my shot up here. I'm just going to make a few changes here to the camera angle, something like this. So you can see that I'm forcing iRay to work with only one sample. Uh, we get a very normal noisy result, but you know it's faster to process, and this is good when you're still in the render setup phase. So now we're going to start moving here to the left in our options here for our 3D view, and we're going to take a look at Scene. So here I'm going to go to Scene, Edit, 
and we have a few options here for this entity. And this is going to refer to the mesh layers that are available in my FBX file. So for example, let me just drop this back over to OpenGL. And I'm just going to zoom out here in my viewport and you can see that, well, I have my turbine mesh, but then I also have this kind of psych wall mesh. And these two objects are separated mesh layers in the FBX file itself. So now in Substance Designer 5.3, I can disable mesh layers. So let's just go to the first option and for is enabled, let's just set this to false. And you can see that that mesh layer is no longer visible. So we'll set this guy to true and let's come over here to the second value. And this is going to be my background object. So here I can just turn this off if I want. And so what this first enabled option is going to do is it's removing this component here from the computation of the render. Now I can set this to on, but then I can just tell its display component to be invisible or turn off. So it's still going to be computed in the render. However, we don't see that here in the viewport. So here, if I just kind of zoom in on this mesh, we also have this mesh display component. So let's take a look at this. And so underneath of this option, we have this subdivision setting. And so what this allows us to do is access subdivision mode. So what this allows us to do is subdivide the mesh in the rendering. And we have two methods. So if I set this here to parametric, this controls the number of times the triangle will be subdivided. And if we set this to length, this is pertaining to the size of the triangle. So iRay will subdivide the mesh enough times so that the triangle becomes the specified length in world units. Generally speaking, you should be careful with subdivision as it can take an infinite amount of time if you set the subdivision values too high or too low of a length. Also, subdivision doesn't smooth the mesh like tessellation does. It only tessellates while still keeping the angles. In terms of setting the value, only the first slider control is used. The second slider doesn't control anything, and we're going to remove that in a future update. So let's make sure that we set the subdivision to none. And for my background mesh here, you can see that it's still enabled for the render. So let's just go ahead and disable this as well. So in my particular case, um, I created this background mesh here. But you don't actually have to create a background mesh like this. We're going to take a look at the environment settings where we can actually create a ground plane for us in iRay. So for now, let's come over to this background mesh and let's just disable this. Notice here that I'm disabling it instead of just turning off its display component because I don't want this background mesh to be used in the render computation. So now let's jump over to our environment. So I'm just going to go to environment and click the edit button. And so here we start to see the properties here for our 3D view. Now these are going to be in context to the renderer that we have chosen. Since we were in OpenGL, we're seeing the environment settings here for OpenGL. There's one new feature that I want to showcase that works with both the OpenGL and iRay renderers. We can use the shift, control, right mouse button, keyboard shortcut to rotate the environment. So now let's just activate iRay. So we'll go to renderer, iRay. Now you'll notice that our environment didn't change. So here I'm going to go to environment and I'm going to click the edit button once more. So now we see the properties have been populated with the iRay specific environment settings. So here we have our exposure control as well as our dome and dome ground controls. Now the dome is just going to reference the dome type. So for instance, here we have a sphere, which means we have a sphere surrounding our scene and we can switch this type. So here we have several options. So for instance, we could choose an infinite sphere. If we have this set to sphere, we can actually adjust the size of the sphere by using this radius setting. This radius setting is also going to work if we use the option sphere with ground. So notice here we have a sphere that's really like a dome with a flat ground plane. And we can adjust the size of this here using this radius setting. Now, if we switch this here to box with ground, and here I'll just zoom out in the viewport just a bit. We now have a box with a ground plane. To adjust the box, we can use the width, height, and depth settings. And we also have the ability to utilize this visualize option, which lets us see the faces of the box. So here I'm going to turn off visualize, and I'm going to set this to sphere with ground. Now, if I want to activate a ground plane, I can come over to this dome ground setting and I can enable the ground. And so here, let's just zoom in on the viewport a bit. Now, our render is very noisy at this stage, and that's because we have a very, very low min and max sample rate just as we work through kind of this preview stage of setting up our render.
So now we have this ground plane that's acting like a shadow catcher that's underneath of our object. And so we have the ability to position this shadow casting ground plane uh, by using these three position sliders. So this is going to be our X, Y, and our Z. So for instance, if I come up to the Y slider and I just adjust this, you can see that I'm just raising that plane in the Y axis. So let's set this back to zero. Also notice that we have some reflectivity taking place here, so we can actually adjust the reflectivity. So here, let me just bring my color editor over here into the capture view, and you can see that by setting this value to white, we are making this ground plane reflective. And if we start to move this to a darker value, we decrease the reflectivity. So if I set this value up to a high reflectivity, I can also adjust the glossiness by using our glossiness slider as well as our shadow intensity. Now we also have this texture scale setting. So notice here that we have our ground plane and the environment is being projected here onto this ground plane. And right now the scale is very large here. So this doesn't look proportional in terms of the scale ratio between our object here and our ground plane. So what we can do is adjust our texture scale. So I'm just gonna drop this value here And you can see that changes the overall scale of this texture. However, it's starting to give us some distortion issues here on the edges. Now, you'll get different results depending on the environment that you're using. So here I have my environment maps in my library, and I'm just gonna drag into the 3D view a different environment to change it. And so here I'll just make a few adjustments to my camera angle, as well as come in and adjust my exposure here. And now I'm going to go back over here to my render settings and I'm going to change my min and max samples. So here, let's just set this to something like maybe 100 and a max of uh, 250 and maybe I'll set this uh, max time here to 10 seconds. So now I'll just jump back over to my environment and make a few changes here to my ground plane. So for the reflectivity, uh, let's just drop the value here. And I'm going to decrease the glossiness. And so in the case of using this studio environment, you can see that using the sphere with ground and the dome ground enabled gives us a very nice environment with a shadow catching ground plane without having to create another piece of geometry like I showed earlier. But again, you're going to get different results based on the type of environment that you use. So just quickly, I'll just drag in another environment. Here in this case, I might try to adjust my texture scale. And so here with this environment, if I like this environment for the lighting and reflection, but I don't like the type of presentation it's giving me here, well, I can just go back over to uh, my scene here and I'm just gonna enable my ground plane mesh layer. And so here I'll just set up my camera angle. And so here in this case, I'm able to get this nice backdrop and use any environment map that I want for the render. So next up, let's jump over to our camera. So here I'm just going to click the edit button for our camera. And here are all of our camera settings. We have the camera component now, which allows us to change our focal length as well as our rendering resolution. So right now, by default, you can see that use window resolution is enabled. And that means that whatever resolution I have set here in my 3D view is going to be the pixel resolution when I actually save the render. So if I come over to camera, save render, it's going to save the render at the resolution, again, of the viewport size. Now, if I want to render to a higher resolution, all I need to do is just disable the use window resolution option. And then here I can set my width and height pixel resolution. And you can set this to any value that you want, or better said, any resolution that your computer can handle. We also have the ability to work with depth of field. So we have our focal distance and our aperture diameter. So here in my viewport, I'm just going to just change my camera angle a bit, get a, a little bit more of an extreme angle here. And I'm gonna to start to adjust my aperture diameter. So I'll set this value here. 
And as I start to increase my aperture diameter, you can see that I'm introducing this depth of field. Now, if I want to set the depth of field dynamically, I can just simply hold down the control key and left click an area to set the focal point. And the amount of blur, again, is going to be controlled by this aperture diameter. Now, on top of the iRay render, we still have the ability to work with the Yebis post effects. So you can see that my post effects are enabled. All these settings are the same, and I can work with the post effects in real time. Substance Designer 5.3 has been upgraded to use Yebis 3, so most of the settings are the same. Uh, however, we do have a new auto exposure. And so here you can see that if I enable auto exposure, uh, I have the ability to adjust the mid grade value, uh, the adjustment here for the adaption sensitivity, metering range, uh, and area. And so here I can start to just uh, move my camera angle and the auto exposure will start to adjust itself um, based on the settings that we have here. So in my case, I'm just going to uh, disable this for now. And uh, we also have some extra multi sampling settings as you can see here. So the last thing we're going to cover here is just some of the material changes uh, that are related to the iRay renderer. Uh, I also want to mention that if you do go to your lights here and you can edit your lights, uh, here we have the uh, two point lights we can use that are uh, that have always been part of Substance Designer and available in the OpenGL viewport. These lights can also be utilized in iRay. So if we enable these lights here, uh, you can introduce some directional lighting uh, based on these point lights. The intensity value for these lights uh, are going to need to be uh, cranked up a bit higher. You can actually double click the number value to get an input box where you can manually enter in a higher numeric value. So like I said, you're going to probably want to utilize a higher value here for your numbers for the intensity value when using iRay. So in my case here, I'm just going to take this point light and just disable it for now. So now if we come over to materials, uh, the materials found in the FBX file are listed. However, you'll now see that we have a definitions section. Depending on the renderer that you have chosen, so like in our case, we have iRay enabled. So here you can see that we have these MDL material definitions. And this stands for the NVIDIA material definition language and you can see that we have all of the basic materials that ship with Substance Designer. The shaders are now using an MDL definition for the iRay renderer. If we switch this back to the OpenGL render, you'll see the standard OpenGL shaders. So for instance, here you can see that we have our physically based metal rough and our physically based specular glossiness workflows. So what's really powerful about this is that you don't have to change any of the texturing that you do. If you're working with physically based, you're just going to be working with the exact same outputs that you've been working with for the OpenGL renderer. In order to utilize iRay, you simply just need to turn it on. Now, the iRay material definition does give us some extra channels to work with and let's take a look at those so here I'm gonna to go to edit and here in the properties you can see that I now have the ability to work with anisotropic materials as well as refraction and absorption or subsurface now in my case for this particular material I'm just using my standard PBR metal rough outputs so base color normal roughness metallic and ambient occlusion and all of those are still very valid for this physically based MDL. However, like I'm showing here, we do have these extra channels if you wanted to use those for your specific material. Also, if you come over to materials, uh, you can see that you can come over here to your definitions and you can load an IRA shared material that was created using the material definition language. So that's going to close out this tutorial on using iRay and Substance Designer 5.3. As you can see, iRay is very simple to use. It works with all of the materials that you've created using the OpenGL renderer. And using iRay within Substance Designer, you can now create high resolution marketing images and portfolio content without having to export to third party renders.